and we'll see if this works. <laughs> so thanks for uh, thanks for coming on. This is a long time coming. It's really, really long overdue. So initially it was going to be like I was going to send you an email with all these questions, and then you write the answers down. But this is so much easier. So I can just pontificate, start talking, which is better than you type it. Yeah, I so I was just looking through my notes. I've done 135 interviews for Dying Scene over the years. This is yeah. the 11th one of like these little quarantine weekly sessions, but I've done 135 interviews for Dying Scene. I hate doing email interviews. <laughs> they're, they are the worst. <laughs> there, there are some artists that love them. Like I've known Trevor from face to face for 25 years. Yeah, he still likes, he yeah. likes doing email interviews. I'm like, Trevor, it's me. Like, you know me. We, <laughs> and so he finally granted me an in-person one last time they came through. But uh, yeah, some people love them because that way they can think out what they're going to say. And I get it. Right. But I'm, I'm not like that. I'd rather have a conversation. I agree. I mean, the conversation allows things to come out and, and get sometimes you delve deeper. And it, 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 I get the, the email interview and I've done those and they're fine. Um, it does give you time to flesh out an answer in a different way. Um, but I mean, you're not a gotcha interview guy, Jason, so I'm not no. concerned about that. So, Daryl, tell me about that time. <laughs> what the hell's going on? <laughs> no, and I think that stuff is weird. And, and because, it's, because it's live, I have prefaced some of these uh, interviews, at least the ones I've done over Instagram with people. I've done a lot of them with people that I know already. But yeah. for the ones that I've done with people that I haven't actually talked to, I make sure to tell them, look, if there's, if I ask a question that you don't want to answer, just say, skip, move on. Like, I don't take that shit personally. So I'm okay. fine with that. I'm, I'm good. This will pretend this is live. Pretending. It's, it's live to us. <laughs> right. It's, it's live to us. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'm used to doing them over the phone too. Uh, right. So it's good because this allows you, it feels more like an actual conversation. Right, because I'm looking at your face. I can see you're hanging yeah. out. That's nice. It's good. Right. I'm in my office and it's sunny. It's it just the light shining upon me, you know, illuminating me. My Liars Club T-shirt. It's you know. Yeah, that's uh, you did a pretty good job planning out where you were gonna sit. <laughs> no, I, it's just this is where my desk is. It's like I'm just stuck right here, you know. And that's just the way it is right now. So we're just living in the COVID land. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> I do these. Uh, we have like a three-season porch. I live in a three-family house. Uh, and we have a three season porch. And so because I'm essentially working from home, my wife works for a college, so she's working from home yeah. and we've got a sixth grader. So we all need spaces. So uh, they hung up Ivy in the background. <laughs> they, should, they should look like I'm sitting at Wrigley, I guess. It, I right, exactly. There you go. Good for you. Good for you. That's uh, for you. So yeah, thanks for doing this. Um, you're, when I when I decided to do something during quarantine to because we can't go to shows and the actual dying scene website has been down for six or seven months now wow. for reasons that are I'm a Luddite so it's way over my head um, but I decided to start doing something as a way to keep connected and to see what people were doing during quarantine and so that's sort of what got this whole thing started and yours was on the short list of people that of names that I came up with to talk to early on because you're an ER physician and it's COVID-19 and there's a lot of shit that a lot of us didn't understand, still don't understand. Yeah, so I've been doing nothing during quarantine, you know. I'm not at all. Just, no, just sitting in your office. <laughs> right, just not doing anything. It's just, I've just been, you know, locked up. In my, yeah, there, there's a lot going on. I mean, it is, it's a, I mean, really think about that. It's like we as human beings living now are experiencing something that most living human beings have never experienced. I mean, that this is unprecedented for us. And, you know, you're, you're watching a lot of things happen in real time, which is unnerving to people. Um, you know, the reliance upon everybody being all knowing in some sense, or at least the illusion of people sure. being on the yeah. way has suddenly been totally ripped off. You know, it's like there's totally a, a man from Kansas behind the curtain and you're like, oh, that green head doesn't breathe fire. <laughs> you know? And so it, that, that's the big thing that people have, have started to witness is that there's this peeling off of this veil of almost blindness where people couldn't see 
what, what they didn't see what they wanted to see. They could see what they wanted to see all the time, and now you can't do that anymore. And, um, you know, the exposure to all these holes in the armor that people were wearing all the time are just gaping. You know, they're just these large open spaces that, that allow all kinds of nastiness to get through. Um, but people can patch things, but people are impatient. They're like, no, you, you got to fix this now. You're supposed to know. Right. And as healthcare providers dealing with, you know, you know, COVID-19, you know, in the beginning, we didn't have a lot of information. We're still garnering information now. Don't get me wrong. There's still right. a lot that we're, we're learning. Um, that was my kid running by back there. Um, <laughs> Mine usually one, does when I do them live. She'll poke yeah, one, of the, one of the three are just running around. They're like outside <laughs> playing in the water. It's actually not that warm up. Um, but we, we're learning more things in real time as we continue to take care of patients, as we continue to learn more about the virus and how it affects, you know, certain, you know, proteins, how it affects, you know, certain cellular function, um, you know, and then trying to, once again, figure out the best treatment modalities for that, which those things are going to change. I mean, the thing that we're finding is that there's this level of impatience associated with it that, like, you got to figure this out today. Right. I need to do something tomorrow. It's like, that's not the way it works. You know, we, we have to use, you know, a, a methodology to go through things to make sure that we do things safe and right. You, you definitely want somebody to double check, you know, the flaps on the plane you're flying to someplace to, to make sure it's not going to fall out of the sky. Right. And, and you're not going to say, oh, just hastily just go. There, there's a reason why there's a method to do things. And as soon as you stop doing that, because you act upon, you know, this, this fear, I mean, that, that's the thing, being completely afraid. Um, you know, when you have fear, you're, you start to do things that are dangerous and irrational. Um, fear leads to kind of irrational actions and you start to not follow the protocol of things. And when you do that, grievous errors are made. You know, that, that's where you, you run into problems. So in, in, as I've said before in, in other clinics, I say it to my daughter all the time too, I mean, it's okay to be scared. You know, when you're scared of something, it's like, okay, well, I'm scared of that. But then you can learn about it and realize it's, you don't need to be scared anymore. But when you're afraid and it's a deep-seated fear of something that you just are going to never touch, never do, you, you start making irrational decisions and that's when bad things just happen after that. So, so dealing with this disease, initially everybody was pretty scared, you know. But as we started to learn more and more and, you know, my colleagues and I become more comfortable in dealing with the disease process. I mean, you go back, you know, three months ago and you had, you know, all of us were really, really like, hey, you know, not saying that you can't have a healthy, you know, bit of, you know, being scared about this stuff. You know, there's definitely things you have to be cautious about, but then we learn protocols to keep ourselves safe. So we follow these things. We make sure we have proper PPE when we were taking care of patients. Make sure that we actually do sanitation as we normally do, as we do it even more so. You know, have proper, you know, goggles. Make sure that we're not taking all of the garb that we're wearing to our homes. You know, make sure that we shower down afterwards. All these things to prevent the risk of us contracting the disease or us spreading the disease to people around us. Um, so, I mean, when people are like, there were so many people that are afraid to come to the hospital for the longest time because of yeah. COVID, but I mean, you're more likely to get it outside of the hospital setting, to be quite honest. I mean, that's where, you know, there's a free fall on how things are done versus having, you know, a set of standards that we're going to follow to try to prevent individuals from getting ill. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the whole, you know, thing of treating this disease, you know, the thing that gets me more, you know, I, I guess un unnerved is, you know, the, the kind of, when people become comfortable, sometimes they become complacent. And, you know, complacency is what's gonna kill you. Um, when you suddenly start taking shortcuts or doing things that aren't typically what we do. Um, so I, I, I want all my colleagues out there to always remember that this is still what we're dealing with. And, and until we are truly to a point where we have a <laughs> effective, um, you know, safe, um, you know, uh, you know, vaccination, you know, until we have reached herd immunity, which, you know, from the standpoint of exposing everybody to that, that's an impossibility right, right. now. I mean, only 5% of the population has been, you know, infected with the disease at this point. Right. That we know of. I mean, it could be a higher number, but it's still not at the 60, 70% of the population that needs to be, you know, effectively infected 
to reach herd immunity. And to do that, you're going to have, you know, death tolls of 800,000 people. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so you, you have to be really cognizant of where we are. And when people start feeling, I'm really comfortable, I'm going to start doing more things. You know, that's when you start, you know, standing up on your bike and doing tricks on the bike. <laughs> You know, you start, you know, doing, you know, bunny hops and you start doing supermans and next thing you know, you've broken both your wrists and you have a head injury, you know, right. you're not being safe. So, um, you know, I, I want people to be, understand that we're still in the throes of this, where we, people have been doing a great job before of trying to keep spread to a minimum, um, but we got to keep watching what's going to happen. Yeah, we might have something die down now and the predictions are that we're going to have, you know, a, another spike in the fall winter you know and then with that comes flu as well influenza as well so you know you hope that that we're not insane individuals and that we've learned something and that we you know have learned that hey maybe uh the idea of when you get sick that you don't go into a public place that you stay <laughs> um but the unfortunate thing that doesn't go along with that is that many people have gotten sick and they are obligated to go to work right. because that's the only way they're going to garner a wage to pay their rent. And, you know, we, we haven't as a nation looked at things to say, maybe we look at ourselves as a society and we start saying, what, what really makes a healthy society? Maybe healthy people. Right. We should have safeguards in place that allow individuals to be at home when they're sick so they don't make everybody else sick and take care of the public. Um, maybe we have, you know, better access to healthcare, better access to food, you know, better access to, you know, make sure wage disparities are fixed. There's a whole bunch of things that go in, <laughs> factor into a lot of stuff that's going on right now. Right. Um, so I mean, for, for people to really look at all these problems and, and try to make them into a, a simple fix, you know, the disease process itself is something that's out there. And we can look at how we treat the disease, but then let's look at the, the you know, armor we were wearing in the first place and realized that there were a bunch of holes in it. Right. And we were told, no, you're wearing completely safe armor at this point. And, and our society was full of holes, <laughs> you know, and now this big hole that suddenly appears in it totally makes us exposed. And we're like, holy crap, that's, that's what was going on. I mean, you think about this, eyes have been open to a lot of things that were that truly existed for the longest period of time, which is people just chose not to believe it. Right. And now it's like, you mean there, there's, there's, racial disparities on the planet. Well, yeah, they've been there for a long time. People, right? Yeah, they've been happening for years and years and years and years. And it's like, now suddenly there's this perfect storm of people to look at, wow, they're, the problems that are here need to be fixed at a root, you know, at the root, not pruning the tree up here. You got to fix the root or the whole tree's going to die. You know, it's Ragnarok, you know, it's the world tree is going to go back. I mean, that's the thing. So um, I could use many other analogies. It's yeah, right. Ragnarok, it's a phoenix, it's, you know, an or it's a, it's a body that's dying because it's, you know, you've got a body that's got a 99% body surface area burn, that's going to, you're going to die. You know, you right. can't do the 1% if it's going to be okay. Um, so there's, we, we have to start looking at, you know, our, our, our society as an organism that is in the throes of, of dying. It's on life support. And what do we do to fix that? You know, you don't just say, hey, give me pain medication to make the pain go away. You have to say, what's the underlying disease process and how do you fix it? It might be some painful things. It might require, you know, chemotherapy, which will cause individuals to be sick for a period of time before they get well. It might be, you know, uh, a surgery that might lead to discomfort and pain and disability, but then you can recover afterwards if you work at it. But it's, are you willing to do that? You know, you know. It's it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. Just boy, that that answer uh, brings up probably seven more hours worth of questions. <laughs> <laughs> we got to do like a couple series on this, you know? No, so, seriously. Okay. Um, how how off guard do you think you were caught uh, specifically in Illinois? Like, how hard was Illinois hit? Naperville hit uh, with COVID, and how off guard do you think everybody was? Because I don't know where really in the first wave you guys were. I'm in Boston, just north of Boston. And we, yeah. we are one of the epicenters. I think we're still third in the nation in total cases, which is startling. Um, I mean, it, it varies tremendously when you look at, you know, um, caseloads. You know, we, we, we got kind of lumped into the region that includes Chicago. 
So, you know, Chicago definitely had a higher caseload, um, you know, and then we, we had, you know, a, a good number of cases, but we were pretty prepared for, um, well, we prepared ourselves quite well for expecting a surge of patients. And at times, you know, our ICU was at 8% capacity. So we were, we were jumping, um, you know, and, but I think that people did a very, very good job of, you know, flattening the curve out so that we didn't have this massive influx, this massive surge at one time that would overwhelm our, our system. So, and that's the big thing about flattening the curve. That, that whole idea is to allow resources to not be overmaxed, right. to be maxed out. So, so um, people did a great job of that. I think people did a pretty good job all over to, to kind of keep resources that may have become scarce to keep them available for use. And so, and when you flatten the curve out, you realize it just takes the illness and it, it kind of expands it out over time. It just allows you to take care of patients in a longer period of time versus having this massive spike at one time where you get overwhelmed and your ice cream is filled, you don't have enough ventilators, not enough things, but because it rose and then kind of went down, it rose, plateaued, right. plateaued for a bit and rode the plateau and then started dropping now, done a pretty good job. So we were never overwhelmed. Um, we had a lot of sick patients, a lot of sick right. COVID patients that were in the ICU and on our COVID floor. Um, and, you know, they've done a great job of taking care of those patients as well. You know, and, and when you think about that, the patients would get sick, they'd come in and they might be there for, you know, 15 days. So, I mean, that's one of those things you think about that you, you had to ride this out while this person's sick. Hopefully you don't get other sick people in to take over, you need that ventilator at that point. Um, you know, and, and we learned over time too, you know, we learned initially, we thought early intubation was the thing to do. You know, you take these patients to them early, you know, right. put them on early. And it's like, whoa, 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 they're, they're happy, hypoxic, you know, don't, don't do that. You know, try and let them ride out as much as you can. And then learning a little bit more, like, okay, they're riding this out and they get this cytokine storm. And, you know, how, when do you time your, your, you know, your therapies that you're trying? And they, when they start to drop their sats initially, does it happen a little bit later? And then learning those things. So as we've gone through, once I was saying, like I said earlier, you know, this whole idea of learning in real time, yeah. taking care of individuals, you know, you, you start to see where you can start changing your treatment modalities for folks. And, and, and that's what we've been doing. And, and we're learning more and more each day. It's, it, you, you get, you know, data from around the world, from, you know, from other hospitals, from, you know, overseas, and you start to learn from what they've learned. You got to try and learn best practices, no matter what, you know, that's the key thing. But any place that you, you, you've practiced in, you know, other regions around you may have had a different experience and they're going to ask, what did you guys do that helped to keep you guys prepared? And what did you do that we didn't do here? You know, when you look back and do an after action report on everything, yeah, you have yeah. to look back and say, what are the best practices? And you start comparing locally, you know, then regionally, you know, when you go around the state, then you go nationally, then you go internationally. That's how you make progress on things, by making comparisons to see what worked best for you, what worked best for us, how did we have, uh, you know, better outcomes? Um, you know, what, what outcomes did you have that were so poor? And why do you think they were poor? Um, what's your different demographics? All those things can make big differences in how, you know, you, you start your, your next treatment. And, and, and for us, like I said, we, we did a pretty good job of, of, I think, the people around us did a good job of keeping themselves at home. Um, and then the, the secondary thing out of that that comes out of that is a lot of people stayed at home probably to their detriment with other illnesses. That was the big thing that right. people were so afraid to come to the hospital Right. Because, you know, you got these patients that came in with, you know, an appendix that was ruptured. It's like that, that you rarely see that now. You have belly pain. Somebody's there, you know, within the first five hours of having belly pain. Or individuals that waited who had, you know, you know, spinal cord, you know, issues where they said, hey, I'm getting weaker and weaker, and then suddenly they can't walk. They're like, I'm not gonna go to the hospital because of COVID. Right. Uh, you know, somebody who had like bilateral wrist fractures. And it's like, you waited? <laughs> Both your wrists are broken, you waited. But, but that's the thing, it's just, it's light. I'm sorry, man, that light's probably bothering me. There we go, look at that, <laughs> the light's off me now. So, so, I mean, that's, we had a lot of, you know, strides that were made, of course, to care for those patients that came in who were really sick with COVID-19. And then you had this whole thing of having to campaign to make sure that people understood it's still safe to come to the hospital. Right. Um, 
and now, you know, we're seeing volumes are coming back up again. And, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're getting back to kind of business as usual in some senses. We're having more elective surgeries done, things like that. So, um, but there's still COVID, you know, that's not like it's gone. I, I still have to make sure I'm looking at what patient rooms I'm going into and looking at symptomology and making sure I put on PPE and go into the room ready to take on what may be there. Um, so, you know, things definitely have changed in the way that we practice. Um, I think that, you know, we, we were uh, uh, lucky enough to not have a huge, huge influx of individuals at one time. So we weren't overwhelmed like mm -hmm. other parts of the nation had seen, specifically looking at New York, um, which they, they, those hospitals are always kind of over capacity, right. you know? And so right. then you suddenly get hit with another disease process that kind of exposes, once again, those weaknesses, that, that happens. And, and that's horrible, you know? It's like you, you have to start looking at things and analyzing how do we, you know, in, in the healthcare environment, how do we start looking at this, these hospitals that have overcapacity and are dealing with these surges every day? You know, everybody deals with surges every day, all of us are, but, but what is the root cause of that? You know, is it access to care? Is it, you know, the, the way that um, the uh, medical legal system works and people have this liability fear and they wanna get people worked up fast? I mean, there's a lot of things you look at. Is it the way hospitals, you know, suddenly go on, you know, diversion because they haven't opened up other beds knowing that they could actually take on other patients, realizing that those emerging patients might not be the ones that are going to be the lucrative ones for hospitals. And still, you know, elective cases are going to be the ones that pay. I mean, there's all kinds of things you have to look at and see what is being practiced in places. And does the practice lead to some of the problem that's there? Um, so once again, I think a lot of what's happened now in 2020, it's been the year of open of, of good vision. Now it's 2020 vision, man. That's what 2020 is all about. It's like mm -hmm. you see things clearly and go, man. There's a lot of problems there, you know. And you got to fix up some things. There's some big problems that need some real, real answers and, and real action on. And, and I think that's the, the key thing about if you look at the, you know, don't cancel 2020. It's like 2020 is our, our opportunity to see things clearly. Right. Yeah, and I think that because so many of us were stuck at home, and a lot of people are still stuck at home, uh, that that allowed us to open our eyes to some things that other people have been experiencing all along, whether that's uh, race issues, whether that's social issues, whether that's economic issues, whether that's, like you said, access to health care. Uh, we kind of have time to deal, I don't want to say to deal with all that, but if you're sitting on your couch, and you're on your Twitter all day and you're on Instagram all day, you have nothing but time to realize what's going on around you. So right. that when all of these things start happening uh, that have been happening for people for hundreds of years, let's be blatantly honest, uh, but now we have time and you can't really avoid it. You can't just be on to the next thing. Oh, got to take the kid to soccer practice, got a meeting at work, da 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 da. And I think that, that's an important thing about this. I think if you look at it through different eyes again, that a, a part of this has allowed everything to slow down so you can see things a little clearer. You know, if you're always rushing and busy and doing something else, like really you're just caught up in your own, you know, little universe of what happens. And we all are in our own universes all the time, right? But suddenly there's like this time, like you start realizing that you're spending more time with your family and it's like, do I like these people? Like I actually do, you know, that's the thing. You right, know, they're right. really good. And because you're not rushing off to, you know, a dance recital here or swim practice here or this, it's like you, you had to suddenly become, you know, a teacher for the end of the year. <laughs> you know, you're trying to figure out what things you had to do with this. And my kids are so young, it was pretty easy for this stuff. It wasn't like dealing with like a teenager and dealing with yeah. everything. But, you know, you, you got your kids at home, you're figuring out what you're doing with, you know, schooling and, and at home, e-learning. And, you know, then you get to, you know, a, a, a point where it's like, hey, you're done with everything by noon? Yeah. Boy, we have the whole day now if I'm here. It's like, we can do something. And we, we can't go to you know, dance practice. You can't go to swim practice. You can't go out. We got to stay around the house. So what are we going to do? So you play outside, you know, you, you like we used to do as kids. You play outside, <laughs> you know, and around your neighborhood, you know, you, you, 
you suddenly start doing puzzles, you start playing games in the house, you figure out other activities, you start talking about things versus talking at individuals about, you gotta go here, you gotta do this. I still did it to my kids, you gotta do this stuff. But I mean, we really have an opportunity to actually bond with the people that are closest to us because you can't go anyplace else, you're kind of stuck with them. Right. So you kind of like them, you know, that's the right. thing. You know, I started writing the lyrics to a song about the whole thing of being stuck with people in COVID and it's like, there's a line in it about, you know, it's not me, it's not you, it's the virus, you know, kind of like the whole thing, it's not me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, so I, I'm writing this. So Ken and all the guys in the band, I, I wrote some lyrics down about this. <laughs> living in, with, you know, quarantine and what do you suddenly realize that you may not like the people you're with. It's like, whoa, that's not me, man. It's the virus, bro. This, I'm not, right. I really, really like you anyway. That's the thing. So, uh, but I find that, that, you know, my family's really cool and hanging out with them. They, the kids get buggy, but... You know, it's like, what do you expect? You know, they're, they're eight and the twins are eight and the baby's six. They're, they're oh. nuts. So, so they get nutty. They're outside playing in the water right now. That's cold. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's 70 some odd degrees right now. But, they're, <laughs> you know. but I mean, it, that, that's the thing. I think we've learned that you, you have, you find other ways to also engage with your friends. You can't always see them face to face, but you find these new ways of kind of communicating. It's not like you're really, distant socially you might be distant physically and that's the key yeah. thing is physically distant so i think people have taken on social distancing and made like i'll just become you know a hermit or yeah. you know, i'll just live in my you know cave and never come out and it's like no you don't have to be socially distant you can still socialize but it's yeah. a different way of socializing and um so be physically distant yes because you know the ability to spread you know illness if you're close is the higher ability to do that um but you can't be socially distant. Contact people by, you know, a video chat or phone. Write a letter, for Christ's sake. Do something. Um, but you can still socialize with people. Um, and people are finding innovative ways to do that, which is really cool. You know, that's an important thing I think we're learning out of this. And I think we're learning a lot of ways of people working in different ways, too. It's like, do you need to be in an office? Right. You know? Like, is that necessary? It's like, oh, maybe this, people have said all along, it's like, oh, you have to be in the office. And I was like, oh, can't be here, so I guess you don't have to be there. It's yeah, like, oh. right. Okay, cool. Um, so it's it's a it's a big leap. I mean, there's always events that happen in the world that suddenly change the way that the world goes. It's like those you know events. You know, dinosaurs died out because you know yeah. meteor hit. You know, it comes down. And, you know, all these things right. happen because you know evolution occurred. I'm sorry if you don't believe in that evolution occurred and suddenly you know things came out. I've already lose walk. <laughs> and suddenly had brain power and, you know, then suddenly individuals learn how to farm. You know, all these things that change the way humans exist. And now we're looking at another kind of change, you know. And, and you know, change is, it's a transition. And transition in pregnancy, is, as my wife would say, you know, transition is that point where you're going toward delivery. And that sometimes is the most agonizing part of it that can be painful in some sense. And it's not really pain. It's just that what am I saying this? I'm, I can't appropriate that anyway. My, my wife would talk about it and say that, yeah, you're going through a transition and that is hard. And so, but in the end, you have this new life that's there. Right. Right. It's something different, and, but it's going to, you have this new life. So we're in that transition. It might be painful, but something new comes out of that, you know, whatever it is. It could be the child that grows up to be the, you know, the savior of all humanity because they create cures for diseases and find ways to make economic disparity disappear and you know we have this you know wonderful utopia and then we reach out to the stars and we go to other places and we bring that to our you know empire of the earth goes to <laughs> space to meet the the shiar and they don't like us because they're bird people they like the x-men whatever so um that was a geeky little shot that's a good reference yeah. um, so so i mean <laughs> probably meet the 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 Korea and the scrolls first though because they I mean they were the whole thing not the badoon but I mean, so really going deep here. So it, it, like the idea of, um, you know, that happening, or it could be the child that comes out to be, you know, the, the second coming, the, the Antichrist. <laughs> it's going to spread the baby. You got a 666. You find a 666 underneath <laughs> the name. You just, you know, get those daggers out and just start stabbing away. Right. And they take care of it. So, I mean, it, it, that's what, something's going to change. Things change. Um, and I think all of us have to be agents for change, first of all, for ourselves, because that's the first thing you can only react the way you're going to react. So we have to change who we are to be prepared for that. 
Um, you know, organisms that don't adapt to things, organisms that do not adapt, they find their niche and they think my niche is always going to be this way. They, they die out. They go the way of the dodo. You know, if, if we find the way to adapt to change and we don't cling to antiquated, you know, ways of doing things, then we're going to be okay. But those that cling to the antiquated way will find themselves as Luddites gone. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah right, right. Right, that's why we're meeting on Zoom. <laughs> right, right, because <laughs> we're not Luddites. Right. I believe in technology. <laughs> yeah, I believe in it, I just can't do it. I know, uh, exactly. It'll start doing it for you, and then you'll realize it'll say, you're inadequate. You know? I know. I can't do that for you, Jason. I know. Can you open the bay doors for me? I will not do <laughs> Of course, I do have a 12-year-old. She could probably do it for me. Probably, exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly, that's what it goes. Like, you don't know how to do this, Dad? This yeah, time. here, but... Do you think we're at a point where things are, are going to change? Because it seems like we have a lot of these, and I, I'm cynical by nature, so it seems like we have a lot of these uh, touch point moments that should move the needle in the right direction, but especially the last four years. Uh, right. It seems like those events happen and then it's kind of on to the next one. And you kind of roll your eyes and say, okay, on to the next one. I mean, I, I, I think that the easiest thing is for people to become you know, uh, to do nothing. That's the easiest thing to do is to not, to do nothing, to sit still. Um, and that's privilege. Yeah, right? it is, it is. I mean, it's the easiest thing is to do nothing because you benefit from doing nothing. You know, you may put yourself at risk by being active. You know, when you move, you might sprain an ankle. So if you yeah. sit still and do nothing, you don't have the risk of doing that. But then how are you living that? I mean, are you really living? Are you really participating in life at that point? Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think that there's, there's yes, we, we've had these moments where you're like, you could make difference, we can make a difference, we can make a difference. And people have been somewhat resistant towards movement. And that's a hard thing is pushing a little movement. And I think you get little bits of movement each time. It's like, you know, the Grand Canyon didn't appear overnight. Yeah, right. There's a little you know, a bit of erosion that took place over time and it made this magnificent, you know, natural wonder. And so there's always been little bits of erosion taking place over time. And yes, the, the idea of us as human beings, we're very impatient, you know, yeah. because we're, we are, our, our lifespan is, is minuscule compared to that of the expanse of the universe. If you start thinking about it, you might become overwhelmed and you're looking into the eyes of Cthulhu, so you don't want to do that. Yep. But I mean, but I mean you, you have to sometimes take a leap and start saying we have to move in a way. And it takes voices to do that. And it takes people sometimes being introspective to go, man, I might be a part of a problem and I, I can admit to that. And, and once you admit to a problem, you can then fix it. Yeah. You know, it you can't, you, the person who denies that they have, you know, heart disease, they, you know, they keep having episodes of angina. They're, they're walking around and they're having chest pain when they walk. Right. And they come in and you talk and say, you know, this chest pain when you're walking is indicative of you having angina. So we should probably, you know, do, you know, stress test and then probably an angiogram on you. Oh, no, it's indigestion. I don't got that. No. <laughs> My right. friend brought me in so I could be seen. And it's like, well, it, until you actually want to do something about that, you, you acknowledge that there's a problem, then you won't see a problem and you'll never fix it. And then either one, you either have something really bad happen to you that suddenly pushes you over the edge. And even then, people have something really bad happen to them. They get their, you know, stents placed, or they get their triple bypass, and they're like, yep, I'm all fixed. And they go right back to keep on smoking all the cigarettes every day. I'm going to keep on eating all the you know, pork rinds and not exercising. And it's like, you didn't learn anything from that point. So you, you know, epitomize insanity. But I think people are tired of being insane, right? You know, it's like you, you have to suddenly look at it and go, I, most people are tired of it. And, and people are starting to realize that, hey, I might be a part of the problem. I can help fix it. I can admit to it. And no one's going to come down on me. No one's going to look at me and go like, you know, you're horrible. It'll make you a pariah. You know, it's like, no, it's like, you, you, you got a problem? Let's help you fix the problem. I got a problem. Help me fix my problem. You know, you walk around, you got the ability to, to, use your privilege, your power to make something happen. Hey man, I'm behind you a thousand percent to do that. I've been shouting about it forever. I've been <laughs> sitting there peacefully saying about it forever. Nobody's going to pan anything, you know, if you say nothing. Right. But when you have people suddenly saying, 
this has got to stop. And when things got painful enough in you know, the 60s, you know, yeah, they suddenly had desegregation occur. They had you know, the Civil Rights Act occur. You know, individuals could vote. All, the, all these things happened because there was pressure and there was difficulty that was painful. So people then had to sort of fix it, but they didn't take care of the whole problem. They just said, let's put a little band-aid on this. Let's take a little bit of you know, some pain medication and make this go away. Right. Instead of saying, you know, there might be cancer there. That you have p- pain in your bones, right. metastases of cancer. Let's find out where the cancer is. Let's fix that. You know, th- that's what you have to do. So, and it might be painful, but, but if you don't do it soon enough, once again, the, you, you will succumb to the disease. You will succumb to the disease. It will kill you. And most of us, down deep in the core of us, our DNA wants to continue to be perpetuated on. And we as a species can't survive if we're all dead. It's the simplest thing. How about that, right? Yeah, I've, I've worked, uh, I think this is actually my 14 year anniversary. I work at an addiction hospital. Happy anniversary. In Massachusetts, I know, randomly enough. Uh, and so we speak in a lot of the same language with our patients, clients, and the terminology that we use varies from time to time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's the same sort of terminology when people are getting in trouble with substance misuse issues, right? It's uh, when do you want to take, start to take care of the problem? Do you wait until you've hit rock bottom, which we can debate whether that's even a thing. Right. Uh, or do you put the brakes on early so that it doesn't take the bottom following, falling out? Because maybe the bottom falling out means that you're dead, right? Yeah. right. The disease of addiction doesn't care. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it kind of feels like we're at that moment. We might be at a rock bottom moment societally. Right. Uh, for for a combination of reasons, this sort of perfect storm, which was a terrible movie, but uh, <laughs> but but it's a good analogy. I think we're at this perfect storm moment of uh, rock bottom. What was that movie with uh, John Cusack? Was it the year two thousand or something? Was that where everything went haywire? You know, uh, it was something like that. Yeah, it was. It was about Y two K or something. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see it. Yeah, see, it's like, you know, Perfect Storm is too good of a movie. I'm talking, you don't get bad movie. You got to talk about the weird disaster movies like 19, like Airport 77 and stuff like that. <laughs> it's like, it's like, that's when you're talking about disaster movies with disaster movies, you know, Earthquake or Towering Inferno. Just, <laughs> right. Just disasters. Like, oh, you know, The Poseidon Adventure. Excellent disaster movie. Come on, there's no Titanic. Poseidon Adventure is my movie. Well, Perfect, Shelley Winters, come on, Shelly Winters. Perfect Ernest Storm Parker. had a Wahlburger in it, so that's pretty disastrous. In my <laughs> <laughs> and I say that as a uh, native of the Boston area. Say, there you go. <laughs> exactly, you know. <laughs> it's pocket kind of cob on over there. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> Although it's different, there is no like that Boston accent that people know as the Boston accent. Boston itself, that doesn't exist anymore. Well. <laughs> After a lot of people that are transplanted in there now, for, come on, come on. Yeah, that like they all the Boston accent people, they don't live in Boston anymore. They live. <laughs> oh, they don't live. Oh, <laughs> oh, come on, no real Bostonians in Boston. Come on, man. not really. No, it's too expensive. <laughs> oh, that's, I, that's true. That's true. Unless you're a police officer, <clears throat> there's it's too expensive. Oh wow, it, look at you, Jason. You're you're, you're on point today. You're on as. Point. And again, I can, as a, someone with a master's in criminal justice and who has worked in the criminal justice field for a long time, there's there's hundreds of Boston police officers making a quarter million dollars a year. Wow. They can afford to live in the city. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, That's interesting. Yeah. I could keep going, but I won't. Yeah. <laughs> we have 45 minutes to go. You can't do it. <laughs> That's for episode two of Jason. Yeah, the series, the series that we have. You know, like our series that we're doing. You know, Jason yeah. and Carol talk. The series, the talk is just about between, you know, you but you at the, you know, the Ivy behind you. Me, right. uh, the Ivy in the office, we'll call it. The <laughs> Ivy in the office. I can get behind that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think this has been a time where a lot of people have had their eyes opened for better. Well, I, I wouldn't say for better, for worse, for better, about yeah. how in the dark they've been for a long time, about yes. how bad things have been for so many people for a long time. I would agree. I mean, it's, it's, I think that 
but then it's like you have to make a choice of what you do with that. Yeah. Continue to feign that you have no, you know, uh, you haven't seen this and you try to unsee it, but you can't. Yeah. Or do you just acknowledge it and say, I don't care, you know, and, and that's what people can do. It's that, that choice that people have to make. Everything's a choice, right? I mean, any, any response to something's a choice. I mean, you, you can choose to, you know, respond to any slight that you perceive as a slight if you want to, or you can be like, yeah, you know, I'm going to fight thing, you know, love your fate and just go yeah. on, with it, you know, and just and say, that's what you do. So, you know, and, and it, it's work, right? Everything's work. You have to work at how your response is tailored to things. You know, it's easy to fly off the handle and just, just emotionally respond. Emotional responses are completely easy and we all have them. It's learning that, you know what, maybe I should think about it first. Yeah. You know, it's hard because emotional responses are, are invoked very quickly. And then sometimes that emotional response leads to this continued utter pain that people want to wallow in, you know, or, or this continued vitriol and anger that they sip into their, you know, their bodies and they, it, it overtakes them and everything becomes raw, you know? So there's definitely a, a fuel to that, you know, and, and it can get you sparked up to do something, but it can also once again lead to actions that don't lead anywhere. Mm -hmm. So once you have that emotional spark that kind of starts yeah. the whole engine, now you gotta have the engine and drive the car and steer it someplace. Because that emotional stuff is just like the Hulk, you know, it's like smash, you know, that's <laughs> right. all it is. Right. And then you have to then be like, you know, smart Hulk, you know, the maestro. You have, well, he's a little evil. But you got to think about, <laughs> you, know, you know, smart banner Hulk and be like, hey, wait a minute, you know, let me drive this this way. Right. You know? let, me, let me take this. I can't just be blatant destruction, you know, which I guess when analyzing the Hulk is a character, one of my favorite characters in Marvel, by the way. Analyzing the Hulk is a character, I mean, the, the – the, the rampaging Hulk is basically really a, a child. That's what he is, a child having a tantrum. Yeah. That's what it is. It's not that he's stupid. It's not that he's not intelligent. It's just that he's a child having a tantrum. And right. He's that's pretty that's well in part of his brain. Yeah, yeah. alone. And, and, and that's it. So it's emotional. And most children respond with emotional responses. They don't have the ability to have this cognitive higher level thinking right now to say, Oh, you know, parent, I, I would like to eat right now. I'm going to, you know, just tell you I'd like to eat. It's more like I got to scream and cry, an emotional response of what we learn first. And, you know, as we become mature adults, when our brain has maturity at age 26, supposedly, that we have brain maturity, you know, we, <laughs> we question for some, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> that, that, you know, then we're supposed to be able to have rational, cogent thinking that takes over, but we still, our first learned responses are emotional responses. So right. anything you see, emotional response fires really quick. But then it's like learning how to control it. And then learning how your response doesn't have to be that response. You know? Do I, and then learning also not to hold on to that emotional response forever. Right. Right. You know? Letting it go. And, and that's hard. People like to anchor those things because it, it, it's a rush. You know, you get that endorphin rush because it, it hits you. Whether it's negative or positive, it hits you. But, you know, speaking of endorphin rushes, yes, <laughs> what can I do for you? Okay, I love you. Good night. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. She says she's going to bed with all the rest of them, but I'll tell you, they'll be yump jumping around for like another hour and a half. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll be like, what the fuck? What's going on? Emotional response. Right. Ah, anger, why are you doing this? <laughs> but I like what they did with the Hulk character. If, even if you're, your only knowledge of Marvel characters is through the Avengers movies, the way that they, sort like his arc, even through the Avengers movies, and that by the end, he realized that, I think the, the thing that Ruffalo says is that he's angry all the time, right? right. He just figured out how to control it. And yeah. he could use his anger for a positive thing too, yes. because we get, we, we can get overwhelmed by our anger and then, and then uh, shut down and be like, Oh, I'm not supposed to be angry. I'm not supposed to be angry. I'm supposed to be advanced. Right. Well, anger isn't bad. It's what you do with the anger. And yeah. so he learned how to sort of funnel that into a positive thing. Right. But, 
is kind of what we should be doing now. Right. Be, be angry at all the injustice that's going on. Be angry at it, you know, and then find ways that we can look at, okay, the root causes and find that we can start changing policy on things. That's the right. key thing. It's like, you know, I, anger will get you noticed because they're going to go, that person's angry. That's right. good. Right. It's the voice that's shouting. So somebody can suddenly hear you. Now right. when they're hearing you, you got to get their attention. Hey, 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 here's what I need. Yeah. You know, and the big need is really, it's, it's trying to get access to power. So that when you have things that people who have, you know, had power, at least by their own notion and, and, and power that's based upon a false notion of, yeah. of, you know, built on, you know, supremacy based upon a, a false notion. Built on this. Right? Yes. Then, then at that point, people have to say, yeah, I, I will power. You can't get things. That's the thing that's funny. It's like you can't get things. You can get things given to you. And it's like, sure, I'm going to give you old school, we'll give you, you know, 80 pounds of silver. Here's what you go. You got your things. You ask for things. You got your things. Right. But it's like, yeah, you gave your things, but now you don't really still own those things. Somebody gave you those things. Right. And you want to be able to keep those things as well. Because if they say, I give you these things on the condition of you never speak up again. Yeah, right. Would you take that? Is, is that the Faustian deal you want to make? I mean, that's the right. crazy thing. So you, you, you have to have action with the, the anger. The anger gets your notice, but now it's like, okay, now they got your attention, here's what I need. What you need is, you know, everybody needs the basic tenets of things to work for everybody as they should. We need to have the social contract that is in place and have it enforced correctly. It can't be, we see the social contract, you know, it works over here this way and it works this yeah, way right right and you know you you can't you have to have once again to get the the basics of life liberty and to pursue happiness you have to have the ability to have life so you have to have you know safety and you have to have you know, criminal justice you have to have you know health you know, which includes not only access to health care, but, you know, individuals having, you know, uh, healthy food, um, healthy living spaces. The environment has to be healthy for all of us to survive on it. You know, we can't live in a toxic environment. You know, you have to have, you know, um, individuals to have, once again, uh, you know, equal protections under the law that, that, that just applied across the board. You have to have um, you know, education, an educated society, a society that can go to the moon, go to the stars, go right. to other places. And if we all have, you know, access to quality education, it's not just access to education, it's quality education. Right, for sure. Then, then, then we as a society move forward. You know, you'll have that kid be the, the person who can, you know, solve the world's hunger problem, to solve, you know, to, to, to get rid of diseases that are plaguing the, the country, um, the world. So that's the thing that you have to have to, to make everything work. So if you have those basic things taken care of, you know, there's no reason for somebody to then suddenly rob, cheat, and steal to do things because, right. hey, all the basics are taken care of, man. You know, wage disparity, wealth disparity is fixed in some sense. If we have the opportunity to, to do things, you can change things equally because I know I'm going to be healthy. I know I'm going to be you know, educated. I know I'm going to have you know, safety. Then what's to worry at that point? Now it's just yeah, all right. about gravy. You know, you can still have capitalism work in itself because then people can say, oh, I have the chance to get more education to work, to get more money to pay you to buy my you know, right. PS5 that's coming out to play, you know, Spider-Man Miles Morales. I mean, that's that should be, you know, that's <laughs> what things. So um, it, it, it's, th that's what you have to look at. Like, what, is, what does society want to be? Does it want to be a healthy society or unhealthy? Um, right. Unhealthy societies costs more you know healthier societies cost less so so it, it, the upfront costs are going to be pay dividends on the other end that's yeah, the right. thing we we'll pay that right. um but people it's hard to get people to give up on their comfort you, you feel very comfortable you know there are a bunch of people in those little chairs in wally you know floating <laughs> around you know <laughs> they don't, just don't want to do anything right so um we, we have to really come to grips with what we really want to be or who we want to be and I think it really starts looking at yourself. Who do you really want to be? Yeah, right. You know, who do you really want to be? You know? Yeah, and that's an uncomfortable thing, but that's, you know, 
through the darkness is where the light comes in, the cracks exactly. in the dark, right? Exactly, every time, every time. It allows you to see things clearly. Right. You, know, you don't be afraid of the dark, you know? It's right. like you, there's nothing to be really afraid of. And I, I had an old counselor friend, and she and I didn't didn't uh, agree on a whole lot of social and moral issues. Uh, but one thing that she said years ago that stuck with me is that uh, you can't see your own ears, right? Everybody else can tell you what your ears look like. Uh, but you can have this image in your brain of what your ears look like, and everybody else is just pointing fingers at you, pointing fingers at you, until you look in the mirror. And then you say, oh, shit, they were right. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. They're pointy and I look like, you know, Black Adam. That's exactly. Like, a, a Submariner. Ooh, what the heck's going on? Wow, a so, Submariner reference. I know. I Listen, I got so many. I'm a big Marvel. I'm a big comic book guy. Marvel, DC, you know, Image, you know, uh, you know anything. It's like I, I read so many comics. It's, it's out of control, stupid. I'm such a geek. It's, it's out of control. It's, I did for a long time. And, though, and now that I'm sitting here, my boxes of comics are immediately to my left now. <laughs> I should probably dig through those again. See, I haven't I seen started, in years. I started going through stuff and I'm like, I gotta, get, I have the, such, my basement is, what did my daughter say the other day? The one that came and gave me that because she, she my wife said something because she's been watching the show Hoarders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I went down and we're in the basement and I'm like, I gotta go through these things to get rid of these comics. And, and she goes, you know, mom says you're a hoarder. I'm like, well, no, <laughs> no, no. That, not true. I just have a lot of comics that need to be gotten rid of. But she said she reward. I'm like, that's not nice. That's oh, that's a diagnosable thing, and I don't. <laughs> I have not had that diagnosis made, so right. I, I mean, I might have clutter. Now, nah, see, and I'm, 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 I'm I, I guess I have a problem. I need some help. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how this. Like, I assumed we went over our time, but it hasn't kicked us off yet. So I don't really know how that works. Maybe this is, I, may, I don't know. Yeah, maybe we did go over the time. Yeah, we're at 7.53 now, I think. Look uh, at you. Look at you getting some kind of extra play. What did you do? You must I don't have know. Been, who, did, who did you give a little handy under the table? To? I, don't, I don't think I have a good uh, a premium Zoom account. I, if, now you must. You if must. I do, I'm not paying for it. <laughs> well, you look at you, you scoff law. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I don't know. That's you can't crazy. Take the kid out of the punk rock show, but you can't take the punk rock show out of the kid. That's exactly. <laughs> you know, Zoom you is going to do just fine as a corporation without my fourteen ninety nine. You got in on the guest list. You were like, "Hey, exactly. exactly. you're going on the guest list. Can I get on the guest list? Man, you can pay for this. Show. Nah, I just keep on the list though. Come on, dude, you can get me in. Like, you, you could pay for a ticket. No, I'm going to get on the list. I flashed the dying scene credential, and you know, <laughs> they got you in. That's like that's a thing. <laughs> Gotta eat. Hey, it's, it's something now. Man. Look at this. I know. It's, it's, it is now. You know, with it, with Ivy in the office now. It's exactly. Be, you know, it's, it's like that's the whole thing. They need to account for it. Ivy in the office. I know. Me. It looks all fancy, right? It's, right. it's not. <laughs> it's fancy. I live in a three-family house. <laughs> it's not mine. I rent it. <laughs> uh, but before they do kick us off, thanks for thanks for talking like this. I'd love to do it again. Uh, this is. This was, like I said, yeah. I have probably seven hours worth of questions that uh, we could solve all of society's problems, I think, probably, just between you and me. I, I think we could, actually. Mostly you. <laughs> <laughs> I try my best. It's like, I, I, I can hardly, you know, solve get my kids to bed on time, for Christ's sake. That's the biggest thing. You know, I, I, wait, I'm supposed to do this, right? Rubino, right? My hair is short now? Shorter? Everybody yeah. see it? I think I did a good picture. It's way shorter than it was. What prompted here's, that? Here's all the hair that was taken off. <laughs> wow. So it was all of this. Wow. Yeah, which is crazy. So that's what, what prompted that? Um, you know, it was like I it's been it's my hair's been so so long. For, I mean it's it's grown forever. I mean I, yeah. it's like eleven years of hair growth right there. And um the one, you know, part of it's you know, the whole COVID thing, you know, it's like that's just a uh, for my for collecting things so it's yeah, like it's right. part of, you know, a bouffant cap this is much easier to put into a bouffant cap i can put it up put it into the cap you know right. but also too you know i i would be sleeping and my hair would be like wrapped around my neck trying to strangle me oh, no. and you know it's like it became sentient at some point it's like you yeah know, right you know, I to do um it, 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 i was you, you know walk I, downstairs to get a snack in the middle right it's like just being carried like like medusa from the inhumans and being carried around 
So, so I mean, I, I, I was, um, I just it got to a point, it's like, it's just so long, I had to cut it. It's still long, yeah, yeah. but it's not like it was. It was hanging down in my butt. It's like, you know, yeah, worry about, it. when you go to the bathroom, what do you do? When you take your hair, you on the shoulder, you can move it out of the way. It's like I just, some animal walking around doing crazy things. Right. I, was, I was on the rower the other day. I was, you gotta keep yourself in shape. You know, that's right. what you gotta do. When you're 50 year old punk rock guy jumping around, you gotta, right. I'm actually not 50 yet, almost 50. <laughs> year. But um, you gotta keep yourself in shape. So I row, you know, I, I, haven't gone to, I haven't gone to the gym for almost like, I don't know, like seven months. Yeah. Um, but I rower, so I row, and my hair got caught in the rower when I was rowing. So I'm like, yeah, this is guy. This is a little too long. You know, I can take it, put it on the side, and and that 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 really does hurt when your hair is pulled when you're trying to stroke through the rower. It, it, yeah. it just really sucks. So it was like <laughs> I, I I had a, a little plan about how to cut it. Yeah, and I was talking to a buddy of mine, Charles, about it, and I'm like, Hey man, where should I cut my hair? And he's like, Dude, like the last time, you did you just look? In the mirror and said, cut right here. That's you. And he's like laughing. So, um, you know, I, I had to figure that and I had a spot. I said I'd cut it like route, you know, a little higher up. And um, then the moment of truth came and it's like, okay, let's cut your hair and start cutting. And I'm like, ah, that's higher than I thought. <laughs> that's, that's more than I expected. And, uh, but it's like, you know, it grows back, you know, what, what am I going to say? It grows back, you know, yeah. people are like, oh, you're going to be like Samson, your power is taken. I'm like, nah, man, I, my power feels a little bit better now. I feel a little looser. My neck doesn't hurt as much. You know, I can not get, you know, my hair is not choking me. I can walk around and not step on it. You know, it's yeah. like. It's, it's it's more aerodynamic now. <laughs> more aerodynamic. I think I probably get more air now because the hair is not right. holding me down as much. You know, we'll see. We'll see. When, whenever shows start back up in 2021, we'll see how that all goes. Hopefully in 2021. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I, I know. It's like, you know. There's all these shows that are scheduled and planned, but, you know, we'll see. It's everything's a day by day thing, right? You know, you can't predict the future. You know, yeah. You know, you live in the present. And, and I think that's going to be like the last thing to come back to. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the thing. I hope that, you know, places that are, are, you know, the venues that we like to haunt and, and frequent yeah. that they can survive. I mean, that's the, that's the kicker. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's I, it, you, you think about it, it just doesn't look good. You know, they can lose 90% of the places that we would yeah. you know, go to to play shows and, and just hang out. The places that help to form these friendships and bonds that you have with all these people that you know, through music, through, you know, going to shows, through just, hanging out it's like those are your places and, and they're they, they can go you know you can go to save our stages and everything we can do that and keep on hitting those things up and it's like man it's like you yeah you look at a society and go what is a society without you know art what is this society without you know entertainment in that sense right. of having music and and you know visual you know uh, entertainment to to keep people live entertainment specifically what what are we what will we be you know how will we be we, we will survive we will adapt but is it are we cultured are we are we right. you know are we the better of ourselves in some sense and i, I think that's we, we can't lose that um and how we keep all these things together it's like i don't know it, it, we have to look at priorities of what we we think are important and i think it is a very important thing yeah. um but you got to look at the other basic things too first and say you know you got to have these other things built up then you can get to that, um, and we hope that something's left. You know, I, I really do hope that something's left. It's going to be back to the days of sweaty basement shows for. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and my basement's full of comic books, so that's a problem right now. So <laughs> right. That, that's, a thing, that's a thing for that. Right. So it's like there are those. <laughs> Daryl, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. I don't want to take up too much of your evening, and we're at like the hour mark now, so. Oh yeah. Make sure just, this saves correctly and I can upload it correctly and all that fun stuff. I hope so, Jason. This was good, man. I, I'm ready. Whenever we need to do part two, three, four, and five of our series, you know, yeah, our yeah. Talk, you know. No, I'm serious. I think that'll be a cool thing. I'd do it, man. It's fun. It's fun. Okay. Next time I, maybe I'll have like a I don't know, so something goofier besides my hair. Maybe I'll have something else that can pull out of nowhere. <laughs> oh, no, I see a Captain America poster down there. 
Oh, you didn't see my Captain America shield. No. <laughs> oh, geez, now I gotta get it. Crap. This is craziness. Oh, man. Oh. All things that I have. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, crazy. it's like, yeah, this is one of those things where you're like, should I buy that? And then you get like goaded into it by, you know, you're talking to your friends and they're like, you should buy it. I'm like, no, nah, I shouldn't buy it. I shouldn't buy it. And then it's like, I'm going to buy that. What is that made out of? Of, of course, it's a vibranium adamantium alloy. Don't oh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Shark, you know? It, it, this is made of like um, uh, fiberglass adium, I think. Is what it is. <laughs> so pure fiberglass adium. Uh, Just as good. Yeah, um, you know, Tony Stark's dad was involved in making this back in the day, I think. Um, made from a uh, little red Corvette right here. <laughs> um, you know, Corvette Summer here with Mark Hamill. Um, you know, wow. <laughs> you know, I make references, man. So, and this poster, this Kirby, this old. Uh, oh, that's know, awesome. America, so I got that some stuff. And, the shadow box of things with Cap, you know, I like Cap too. Cap's a good dude. Yeah. You know, he epitomizes the ideal of what, you know, things are supposed to be. And that's why, you know, like Cap, he's always, he, at times he's always stood against what would happen with, you know, the way the, the, the country would work. And he would be working against it, realizing that it was not to right. the ideal. And that's the, the thing, you know, I, I love Captain America. He's, he's, he stands for the ideal of things. And, you know, when, and so, yeah, a lot of my favorite Marvel guys are Cap and Hulk, you know, Daredevil, Moon Knight. Moon Knight only because he's like, you know, a, just a weirdo. <laughs> you know, sense of that stuff. But, um, you know, so it's like you get these, you know, dudes like that. And you're like, yeah, you know, he's, he's, he's not Marvel's Batman. Let's come on, let's yeah. that up. He's not Marvel's Batman. But, you know, it's, it's like that's all my Marvel dudes are, are pretty fun. But, you know, then I, I go through a D2. We have a whole, whole other, whole other. Cast, we will talk about comics. Yeah, right. That'll be episode three. Like, we'll solve all the world's problems. Yeah, so, so three, right, and then episode three will be comic books and baseball <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> yes. Problem solving episode two. Episode right. three. Why do you have so many comics now? <laughs> <laughs> all my problem solving comes from reading comics. Come on. Exactly. <laughs> ultimate nullifier and just change it. Just, there you go. Galactus is coming. Let's do this. Let's, that'll make us all get together. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and now it's telling me my internet connection is unstable. Uh, uh, so you've been kind of cutting it out a little bit. So uh, that's my fault. So it's probably a good spot to end it. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Of course. Jason. Uh, awesome. Assuming it saves correctly, I'll send a link out within 20 minutes or so. Awesome. Awesome. I love it, man. Cool. It was fun. Let me see if I can save it.